99.5 FM, Kaijur Radio. The time has moved on to 10 hours 3 and we are about to prepare for the Messinga Jones versus Jikam et al. oral submissions. Messinga Jones versus the, elect the Ghan Elections Commission. Good morning, everyone. There are three short matters that uh, we wish to deal with at the beginning. The first is an application. I'm sorry, could we take the appearances, please? Could we get the appearances before we get started? Who's for the appellant? Good morning, Your Honours, and may it please the court. Mr. John Jeremy, Senior Counsel, and Mr. Roy Zilford, Senior Counsel, lead me, Rondell Keller, and we are instructed by Mr. Mayor Robertson for the appellant, Ms. Masinga Jones. Thank you. For the respondents? May it please, Your Honours, I'm Kim Wright Thomas, and I appear on behalf of the second name respondent, the chairman of the Guyan Elections Commission. Yes, Ms. Guy, thank you. Your Honor, is Maxwell Yedwitz, led by the learned Attorney General Basil Williams in the Council of the Fourth Respondent. Yes, please go ahead. Mohammed Khan, with Kashir Khan, and Kalish Lokman, for the fifth and sixth respondents. May it please the court, uh, Devendra Kisun in association with Mahavir Anil Nandalal, Rishi Das, Theresa Haddad, Clay Hackett, all led by Douglas Mendez, Senior Counsel, on behalf of the seventh and eighth respondents, Dr. Bharat Jagdeo and Dr. Muhammad Irfan Ali. May it please your honors, Kamal Ram Koran, for the ninth respondent, Mark France, representing a new and united Guyana. May it, please your, may it please your honor, Hari Ramkaran, appearing for Lennox Schumann, the tenth named the respondent, who represents the Liberty and Justice Party. If it pleases the court, Tim Matthew Jones, for Daniel Josh Kanai, representing the movement, the 11th named respondent. If it pleases your honors, Sanjeev Datadin, in association with Mr. Stephen A. Singh, Jamila Ali, and Donovan Rangaya, for Mr. Vishnu Bandhu, represented the United Republican Party. Yes, thank you, Council. We have received an application which we circulated by email by uh, Mr. Safir Hussein to be joined in this appeal. We invited him to uh, put in some submissions in relation to his application. He did so, and we considered those, uh, those submissions. Uh, the court uh, believes that the matters that he wishes to raise at this stage are already before the court in the other submissions that uh, have been filed now and that were made before the high court. Seeing that Mr. Hussein, as far as we can tell from the record, was not heard by uh, the high court, we see no uh, benefit now in, in allowing his application to join at this stage. And so we are not inclined to grant his application. We therefore strike it out and we will proceed as already indicated at the case management conference. 
And so we now invite uh, the appellants, Councillor for, uh, for the appellant, for, for the proceed. Your Honours, Mr. Robertson in Guyana has asked me to use a minute or two of my speaking time. And with your leave, I propose to do so. Mr. Robertson. Thank, thank you, Your Honours, and good morning. Good morning. Your Honours, we believe that the Learned Chief Justice below got two things right. First, we believe she was correct in her finding that the court had jurisdiction to hear this matter. We also believe that the Learned Chief Justice was right when she issued a caution below that counsel refrain from gratuitous politically charged remarks. I don't know that it was directed at anyone in particular, but as Bob Marley would say, who the cap fit, let them wear it. Your Honor, apart from that, the case of the appellant this morning falls under three broad headings. The first one was, the first one is, what is the impact of the decision of the CCJ, Ali and Jagdiel versus David upon the national recount, Order 60 of 2020, and the returns of the 10 returning officers furnished in March to the CEO? That's the first heading. The second heading would be the constitutionality of Section 22 of the Election Laws Amendment Act Number 15 of 2000. And then the third heading would be the respective powers, duties, and obligations of the chief election officer, the chair of GCOM, and the commission itself with respect to the declaration of results having regard to articles 162, 163, 177, 2B of the Constitution, Section 96 of the Representation of the People Act, and Section 18 of the Election Laws Amendment Act. Our written submissions have, and our oral submissions will, address these broad issues in greater detail. We believe that the judgment of the court below incorrectly determined all of the questions related to, this, to these issues. And with the court's permission, before I yield to my learned senior, to amplify our written submissions, I would like to address the court on one small area in which the court below clearly fell into error. I refer specifically to the court's finding that this court in the Ulitamor appeal had concluded that the constitutionality of section 22 had to be challenged by election petition only. The Chief Justice's finding was anchored in her interpretation of this court's language in paragraphs 106 and 107 of the Ulita Moore judgment. Your Honors, I believe a little context here will explain why the finding of the Chief Justice on this issue cannot withstand scrutiny. In the Moore appeal, Mr. Keith Scotland, one of counsel for the appellant, had raised for the first time the issue of the constitutionality of Section 22. Your Honor, Mr. Justice Prasad expressed the clear view that the matter, not having been raised in the court below, could not be raised for the first time in this court. In paragraph 12 of his opinion, he called such an approach an unacceptable state of affairs. The majority, in its opinion, in its judgment, though the language was probably slightly more equivocal, essentially shared the view of Justice Passat. That is why at paragraph 106 of the majority opinion, the view was expressed that the constitutionality of section 22 
is a matter to be frontally examined by the court at a full hearing. Such a full hearing is exactly what Ms. Jones initiated in her fixed date application. Specifically in paragraph Roman numeral 18 of the declaration sought, she specifically requests a declaration that section 22 is unconstitutional. One cannot get more frontal than that, Your Honors. In her fixed date application, there was an opportunity for extensive oral and written submissions. And since the section 22 issue is essentially a matter of pure law, it is respectfully submitted that when this court talked about a frontal attack, the court was not talking about a trial in which witnesses are heard and cross-examination takes place, such as in an election petition. While we have no quarrel with the view that constitutionality can be canvassed in an election petition, the majority opinion in the Moore Appeal Court does not in any manner suggest that the court, that the petition court is the only permissible venue for a challenge. The greatest respect, we believe that the learned Chief Justice was taking impermissible liberty with the language of the Moore Appeal Court. When she found that the decision in the Moore Appeal stands for the proposition that the constitutionality of Section 22 can only be challenged in an election court. And with that, Your Honors, I now yield to my learned senior, Mr. Jeremy, to present the more detailed arguments on behalf of the appellant. Yes, Mr. Mr. Robertson, we will hear all the arguments and um, the court is going to rule on this point in its judgment. So our position today is to hear your views on all of the matters and then we will deal with uh, the clarifications and um, other issues in our judgment. So we have made a Thanks, note of, of your submission on that point. Thank you. Could we move on then now to Mr. Jeremy? Thank you, Your Honors. Your Honors, we appeal from the decision of the learned Chief Justice on on four planks. We launch our appeal on four planks and they correspond in broad terms to the questions which were raised by the Honorable Chief Justice in the court below. The first of those planks is the constitutionality of section 22 of the Election Laws Amendment Act. The learned Chief Justice held in, inter alia that that was a matter which was res judicata. The second is the validity of order 60. And again, the learned Chief Justice held inter alia that that was res judicata. that the only data that could be used for the declaration of the results would have to be the reconc results and that the 10 declarations already validly made in the words of the court at paragraph 77 could not be resurrected at this point in time. Malady, the, the in the court below, the Lenin Chief Justice held that the relief sought in the fixed date application were all based on issues litigated previously, and she felt bound to follow to follow those respective pronouncements on the law. And that's to be found at paragraph 85 of her judgment. 
Millennial Friends have raised Mr. Mendez. I'm not sure whether he's the eighth or the twelfth respondent. I lost count, and I mean no disrespect by this, but we sued four persons. Eight persons, I believe, have been added to, to the list of respondents. There's a cross appeal on the question of jurisdiction, and uh, we say in respect of that, that the Honorable Chief Justice correctly applied the very test which was urged on who by Mr. Mendez in Holada. That is, that is to say that she was exercising a jurisdiction in very narrow terms in judicial review, in very narrow terms because this is strictly speaking a challenge which is taking place in the context of an election. So she, she structured her intervention in Holodar to a test which she said was based on I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Malik. If you just allow me to refer to the decision. She 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 held at paragraph thirty-four that this is a case where the actions of the RO, the returning officer, are up for review. There's prima facie evidence in the affidavit subject to the caveats that permits the hearing of the application. And then she went on to say that at paragraph 42, are you, are you with me, Your Honours? I'm reading, reading from paragraph Judgment, Jeremy. Holodar or this matter? Holodar at paragraph 42, the decision of the learned yeah. chief justice. As well as 34 before that? 34 before that. Of Holodar. Holodar. Yes. Yes, we're with you. Okay, so at paragraph 42, she says, after citing Petrie and Sikoma, she says, there can clearly be cases where the court's supervisory jurisdiction can be invoked to, ens to ensure the correct and smooth operation of progress of the election proceedings or process. I have concluded that the applicant's case is such a court cannot shirk its duty in this regard and shelter behind a contention that an election petition should be filed when the case clearly does not so warrant. So that is all that I have to say with respect to the cross appeal. I see that the Honorable Chief Justice correctly applied the test which was urged on her by the Six or by, by Mr. Mendez, his respondents. Now, having held that these issues were frontally before her, however, that is to say, the issue with respect to the constitutionality of Section 22, the constitutionality of the functions undertaken by GCOM, she the High Court, we say, ought to have determined those questions, but instead they held, she held, the Learned Chief Justice held, that although she had jurisdiction, the issues were res judicata. Now, I say, and I would, I, I argue that they clearly will not. There's clear authority for the proposition that res judicata does not apply in these cases. And with respect to these points, Your Honor, if I could speak quickly to the constitutionality of Section 22, which was before her. Our attack on the constitutionality of Section 22, it's apparent on the face of it. Section 22 is contained in the Election Laws Amendment Act. 
That act was enacted in 2000. It was enacted as Act 15 of 2000. The Constitution, as we all know, was enacted in 1980 and contains the usual supreme law clause that is found in all of our Commonwealth Caribbean constitutions. That clause in Guyana, as Your Honor knows, is in Article 8 of the Constitution. Article 8 provides that this constitution is the supreme law of Guyana and the comma. If any other law is inconsistent with it, the other law shall, I interject here, not me, the other law shall, to the extent of the inconsistency, be void. Those words are clear and admit of no interpretation. Article 170 of the Constitution provides the mode for making legislation. Article 170 says that legislation, the legislative functions, that's a side note, mode of legislation. Are you with me, Your Honors? Yes, Mr. Jeremy, we're with you. Okay, I'm sorry that I'm speeding, but I did not in expect Mr. Robertson to be that long, and I'm aware of the, my time constraints. Justice Bassard will let you know how much more time you have. Yes. So that Article, 7, Article 7, 170 provides the mode for making legislation. It says that the legislative function shall, not me, shall be exercised by bills passed by the National Assembly and assented to by the President. Language there again is mandatory. That is, that's in 171 of the Constitution. Your Honor, Section 22 purports to repose lawmaking power in GCOM. In the court below, argument that is hidden from this court, my learned friends on the other side said that a paragraph, this is at a paragraph 26 of 20, I'm sorry, a paragraph 27, that it is constitutionally permissible. This is in their skeleton submission in the court below. At paragraph 20, 20 I think it is paragraph 26. They say that it is constitutionally permissible for the legislature to delegate a power to amend legislative provisions. But then these are, these are the, clinch, the clinch words, the clutch words. Once the power was delegated with clear legislative or policy guidelines. Now you have a problem there because of those words. Once the power is delegated with clear legislative or policy guidelines. Now it is clear from their own submissions in the court below, which we do not see before your, your honors, but it was before the judge in the court below, that they then referred to, uh, in paragraph 27 of their submissions, towards the end of the paragraph, the case of Whitman versus American Trucking. A decision, an, an American case, because that's all it, that they, they could find to support for this delegation of the legislative function. A decision of Justice Scalia, who's no longer with us, and he says there, and it's quoted in their submission, in the history of the court, we have found the requisite intelligible principle, equivalent to our principle that the power has to be delegated with clear legislative or policy guidelines. We have found that principle lacking in only two statutes, one of which provided literally no guidance for the exercise of discretion. We say, Your Honors, that Section 22 is wide, it is unfettered, it is unregulated, so that it falls within the words essayed by Justice Scalia in Malinid Friends' 
all submissions before the Honorable Chief Justice in the court below. It's wide, it's unfettered, and it's unregulated. Why we say so? Your Honours, in Re Delhi Laws Act, the Indian Supreme Court stated that this is to be found in our submissions at page one, at page seven towards the end of the page. Delegation of this kind cannot proceed beyond that. It cannot extend to the repealing or altering in essential particulars laws which are already in force in the area in question. That's paragraph 17 of our submissions before your honors. There's a stronger statement in AC Hosey versus Sivan Palai and others. Now, in that case, the court held at just, this is also in our submissions, at page 11, that towards the top of the page, where there's an act and express rules made thereunder, it is not open to the commission to override the act or the rules and to pass orders in direct disobedience to the mandate contained in the act or the rules. In other words, the powers of the commission are, are meant to supplement rather than to supplant the law. That's at page 11 of the keys paragraph 14 of our reply submission. Your Honours, if you also look at paragraph 52 of the decision of the CCJ in Eslin David, the, the CCJ is clear that the notion and the, the mention order 23 or order 60, 23 times, Your Honours. But in effect, this is what they do. I'm not talking about a mention. I'm talking about what they do at Order 60. They say at paragraph 52 that the notion that Order 60 can either impact the interpretation of the Constitution or create a new election regime at variance with the plain words of the Constitution is constitutionally unacceptable. We adopt that and those statements of principle. And so too, we see the, is the notion that the order can amend the legislation. So for all of those reasons, we see that section 22 is unconstitutional. But if, you, if your honors are not with us on that, we see that the purported exercise of the powers are in fact unconstitutional. Now, uh, Mr. Jeremy, you have five minutes remaining. In, in any event, section 22 by its pur purport seeks to amend, this is what it, it does. It seeks to amend the Representation of the People's Act, the National Registration Act, or any relevant subsidiary legislation. It clearly excludes from that the National Assembly Validity of Elections Act, which is the act that operationalizes Section 163 of the Constitution. What the court downstairs could not do, what this court cannot countenance, is a wider interpretation of section 22 than it purports to, to have. If you, what, what section 22 did was to give birth to an order 
which allow for the breaking of the seals of ballot boxes. That's what it says. It allows for the inspection and scrutiny of ballots, allows for, the, for, for GCOM, if satisfied, to, to set aside declaration. All of those are matters for the, for, the, for the High Court under the Constitution. And any such action taken by GCOM is, would, is and must be unconstitutional. We say also that Order 60 is invalid because of the reasons set out in our submission. We argue that it, 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 its, provisions, uh, its provisions conflict with Section 162.1 of the, first of all, section 161 of the Constitution provides that GCOM is subject to the Constitution it, itself. It can't usurp, it, usurp functions under the Constitution. And in so far, and, and the Constitution says that it is, it is subject to the Constitution and other laws. It cannot make an order as it, as it purports to do in Order 60 in respect of the breaking of seals, the examination of election materials, and on top of all of that, give power to someone who is not a judge to overturn the results of the declarations which have already been made. Now, there, there are, are a couple of cases your honors, Sina number two, which is which deals with the question of res judicata and pinup, which we treat with. Now, in Sina number two, the court holds clearly that a decision on procedure alone, not a decision on the merits, looking at the matter, they see positively. A decision on the merits is a decision which establishes certain facts as proved or not in dispute. It states the relevant principles of law applicable to such facts and expresses a conclusion with regard to the effect of the application of those principles to the factual situation. That did not occur in Ulita Moore. So that for the court below to say that she, the Doctrine of res judicata applies is in defiance of the established principles in Garraway, Sina, and Pinnock. So, you, your honors, we say that Order 60 is unconstitutional. It is ultra virus void of no effect. We say that the reliance on uh, the doctrine of res judicata is misconceived and uh, inconsistent with the law that the declarations cannot be set aside outside of uh, an election petition and the superintendence of a, a judge of the high court and that order 16 so far as it purports to do any of those things is, is void. And I refer your honors to the cases of Goff, the Indian cases of Samnath Sala versus State of Mahashtra and Sundar Singh, in which the, the court said explicitly that even if a recount produces a result, even if a, a, re, a recount produces a result, a recount by a commission produ produces a result which demonstrates that the wrong person was declared to have won, that cannot stand in the face of these orthodox principles. Those are the submissions for the African your honors. Thank you, Mr. Jeremy. I apologize if I have run over my time. Right, the court has uh, followed your arguments. We have uh, no questions at this point. So then we will move on to the second respondent, Ms. Kite. Grateful, Your Honors. 
May it please your honors. When one examines the issues raised uh, Ms. by Hyde, just to be clear, excuse me, just to be clear, you have 20 minutes. The respondents uh, have 20 minutes, uh, beginning with you. Wait for your honors. Your honors, we wish to rely on our written submissions. I will use perhaps 10 out of those 20 minutes to just highlight certain portions of those submissions. Your honors, when one properly examines what the appellant is asking this honorable court to do, and we first started off by asking the high court to do, is really to ask the judicial system to aid and abet a specific illegality or a series of illegalities which occurred in this nation, which led to the March 13th declaration. They are asking the judicial system to set aside, remove, set aside the recount numbers, the recount results, which, Your Honor, has been hailed by our highest court as a transparent, credible process. But no, the court should set those figures aside. But instead, the court was ordered Chicom to rely on the March 13 declarations. Both declarations, Your Honor, which led to Chicom exercising its powers in the first place on the Article 162 to ensure that they produce a transparent, credible results from the March 2020 election. Your Honours, I ask this Honourable Court not to be used as an instrument of fraud, because when one analyzes what they're asking you to do, that is exactly what the appellant is asking this Honourable Court to do. Your Honor, they dress up this application in a lot of legal language. So a lot of legalese is used. They base their contention. They say that Section 22 is unlawful. They say that Article 162 gives GCOM, uh, too wide, you know, too many white powers. They contend that GCOM has breached Article 163 of the Constitution. Your Honors, my very short answer to all of that, and we have elaborated on this in our written submissions, but the short answer to all of that is that all of their allegations, their contentions, their attack on specific pieces of legislation, which have formed the basis of, of our electoral laws and framework for a very long time, all of these attacks can be frontally addressed, Your Honors, by virtue of an election petition. So Your Honors, this is my very short answer to all of this. And further, Your Honors, a distinction has to be made between what is an election dispute and what is GCOM attempting to ensure, or as you put it in Benita Moore's decision, GCOM managing the election um, the electoral process. A distinction has to be made. Your Honors, in Haridar, the Honorable Chief Justice first made that distinction after she examined a line of cases. In Haridar, the Honorable Chief Justice said that a court can't find jurisdiction. Sure. So, in short, okay, sorry about that to ensure that a statutory officer complies with clear provisions of the statute. That is not an election dispute, Your Honors. That is ensuring that a returning officer does not commit certain specific illegalities. She come thereafter, so after Halidar and the Chief Justice made a specific ruling I'm coming to what led to the, the decision by GCOM to hold the recount. After Halidar, Your, Your Honours, and a specific order was made, the returning officer, having been in possession of that order, still attempted 
to make declarations in breach of those orders from the Honorable Chief Justice and from the clear provisions of our electoral statutes in this country. It is against that bad wrong, Your Honours. And in the midst of all of that, that she come had to step in, just like the High Court, she come had to step in to ensure that its officer complies with the clear provision of the statute. Respectfully, Your Honours, that is not an election dispute. That distinction was made in Halidar. That is simply GCOM ensuring that its officer acts lawfully and in accordance with the clear provisions of statute. How can that be an election dispute? Ms. Kite, <clears throat> Chief Justice in her judgment uh, found that there was an impasse at the commission that was not disputed, that there was an impasse between uh, the CEO and uh, the chairperson, or at least chair, chairperson as representing the commission. And uh, on that, uh, the Chief Justice found that the court, the High Court, had jurisdiction to step in and exercise uh, that judicial review jurisdiction. Do you agree that the High Court was entitled to, to grant review in relation to the on pass? Because yes, Chief please. Justice explained that it was the court's uh, within the court's jurisdiction as the court had exercised its jurisdiction in Aubrey Norton's case, the Chief Justice found that in order to smooth out and advance the process in light of what had developed at the commission in relation to those letters and the CEO's responses, do you agree that the court had that jurisdiction? Yes, please, Your Honor, because again, why I agree with the Honorable Chief Justice at this point, Your Honor, that is not necessarily an election dispute. This is an attempt, what she found, that this was an attempt to ensure that the electoral process be completed in a swift manner. So that if the supervision relates to ensuring that the electoral process is further, is completed, clarity is brought to it, then yes, the court has that very narrow supervisory discretion, which is what also happened in Halidar, and which this court also found a very narrow discretion also. In Yulita Moore, those things are different, Your Honors, attacking the lawfulness of the election. Th that th those issues are different from coming square within what can be considered an election dispute. Your Honor, what the CEO, um, you know, where the Chief Justice intervened in relation to uh, giving some directions to the CEO. Your Honor, that is not an, ele an election dispute. That is simply an officer being insubordinate and executing what I term clear dereliction of duties. That is not an election dispute. And the court could find supervisory jurisdiction to deal with insubordination by the officers of the Secretariat, just as what happened in Halidar. It is similar. And that is so because, Your Honor, the chief election officer is not a constitutional officer. He's a statutory officer. He's an election officer. He is not shielded by Section 141. And that is why the court had intervened to tell him how he must act. He must act lawfully. He must act in conformity with the laws of this land, which right now, Your Honors, include Order 60. So it was the court telling the chief election officer that he has to act in accordance with Order 60 of 2020, which has not been set aside by our Apex Court or any other court, and which I dare say, Your Honors, 
cannot be set aside in an application of this nature and of this type. I hope I have been helpful. Uh, yes, before. yes, thank you, Ms. Kite. Great for your honors. Your honors, this now brings me to Yelita Moore. I do not agree with Mr. Robertson's attempt this morning to offer to this court his understanding of Yelita Moore's case. When your honor, the court was very clear in distinguishing in Yulita Moore again, what is an election dispute and what is not an election dispute. And the court made certain specific findings in Yulita Moore, which I believe your honor answers a number of questions which my friends are now attempting to raise again. I go your honor to begin with Paragraph 106 of Yulita Moore. The majority decision of the Court of Appeal found, and I'm reading, we agree with the submission that the legality of Section 22 is a matter to be frontally examined by the court at the full hearing. You found that in Pitchery and Sycamore Singh, the High Court declined to examine the constitutionality of election related legislation. I don't know how clear you, your honors could be. During the election period, allocating such questions to an election petition. You didn't, say, you didn't stop there, your honors. You said the court, the court said that such a determination would be disruptive to the election process. Moreover, it is well established that constitutional questions can be determined at the hearing of a petition as discussed in Petrie and Chaitan and the Attorney General and another. You said, alternatively, if GCOM has utilized its power on the Section 22 unlawfully, then that would be a question for determination at such time. Your Honors, respectfully, I do not know how clearer than this a court could be and in relation to the, to the recount, Your Honor, the court then went on to give its blessings to the recount, confirming the orders of the full court and discharging the interim injunctions granted by Justice Holder. And Your Honors, I now wish you to consider 8-5 and 8-6 of this judgment, because at 8-5, this court said the decision whether to hold a recount or not were matters that were central to the elections and fell squarely within the domain of GCOM to determine the management, to determine as part of its management of elections. The functions performed in relation to those responsibilities would be shielded, Your Honors, by Section 141. So, Your Honors, you were not speaking in vacuum. You were specifically analyzing and making findings on section 141, which shields GCOM, unless GCOM is acting either in excess of jurisdiction or acting unconstitutional. Those provisions do not cover the election officers. So that is a clear distinction. And this is confirmed in Halidar, it's confirmed by you and Yulita Moore, and again, it was confirmed by the Honorable Chief Justice in this said matter. A major distinction. So to say that by executing, carrying out the recount, that GCOM was trespassing on Article 163 of the Constitution, Your Honors, respectfully, that argument is flawed and misconceived. GCOM managing the election process to ensure that its officers act lawfully, ensure that their officers act in accordance with clear statutory provisions cannot be seen or viewed as trespassing on Article 163. The very constitution gave GCOM those powers. So while we're talking about Section 22 being unconstitutional, I wish the court 
to look clearly at Article 162.1b of the Constitution, which really gives GCOM those powers. I don't Ms. know what Miss Kite, you will uh, have to wrap up very shortly. Your yes, time is up. Great for your honors. I wish to close with the allegation, your honors, that you are making a point about 162. Yes, I'm saying, Your Honours, that Article 162.1b clearly gives GCOM its powers to manage the process and to ensure that they provide this country with a credible elections results. And that is all GCOM was doing. So to ask you to set aside the recount and return to the controversial March 13th, Declarations, Your Honor, simply ask this court to be an instrument of fraud. I ask this court to desist from that. I close finally, Your Honors. I believe I've made a point that the Chief Elections Officer is a statutory officer and he is subject to the disciplinary control of the Commission. I wish Your Honors to look, and I've listed in my submissions a number of very clear provisions which show that he cannot flout the law, he cannot act in, a, in excess of the law. His report must be constrained. His report must be in accordance with the law. And right now, Article or the 60 forms part of the electoral laws in this country. So he must act in accordance with that. And Your Honor, one final point, I, I'm over my time. The question of res judicata, the fact, Your Honors, that nine-tenth of what the appellant here is asking this court, those very questions were asked by Ulita Moore. Should, is a clear indication to this court that these issues have been litigated before. And this is an attempt to re-litigate those issues. That, Your Honors, amongst so an abuse of the process of court and I ask for those reasons and for the other reasons which are outlined in my written submissions that you swiftly dismiss this appeal. Diana needs closure to the electoral process. I thank you, Your Honours. Okay, thank you, Ms. Kite. We now move to the Attorney General, fourth name. Thank you, may it please, Your Honours. Your Honours. We have filed in a respondent's appeal 10 grounds, and I respectfully propose to deal with five of those grounds and my learned friend, Mr. Maxwell Edward, to deal with the, the others. In the first instance, Your Honors. Mr. Williams? Yes, please. Those grounds, those 10 grounds, are you dealing with your cross appeal or is it? My cross. Allowed? And I well, wrap the court I had indicated replied. that you would be allowed um, some time after that the two uh, persons, the two parties, three parties who have filed cross appeals, most grateful you be allowed 15 minutes after to address the court on the cross appeals. So that would be your, well, uh, the seventh and eighth named and yourself. Most grateful. So that this is the time for you to reply for, to the, uh, the main appeal, to the submissions of the appellants in the main appeal. But it's uh, up to you how you wish to manage. Yes, please. Your Honor, thank you very much. Uh, we thank you. We wish to say in the first instance that the learned and honorable Chief Justice erred in law and misdirected herself and she misinterpreted the provisions of Article 177.2b and held that the elections and read into that provision words that he cannot act on his own when she found that the Chief Election Officer does not have a constitutional mandate and when she also held that 177.2b means that GCOM is not to act on the advice of any person or body external to the commission. Your, your Honor, those words 
are not in Article 1, Sentence 7, 2 be in fact the opposite, in which Article 1, Sentence 7 requires him to act alone in his advice to the Commission. The words in Article 1, Sentence 7, 2 b shall and acting only in accordance with the advice are mandatory, Your Honours. And they have three monetary requirements or commands. And it's a simple, natural, grammatical, and literal meaning of Article 177 to be that is the approach that gives effect to the purpose of the constitutional provision. Yes, in many cases, we did that there, DuPont Steel, Sussex Bridge case. But the three mandatory requirements are one, the presidential candidate that receives the most votes shall be deemed to be elected as president. Two, the chairman shall declare the presidential candidate to be the elected president. Three, the chairman shall make the declaration using only the advice of the chief elections officer. And they, these interpretations are on shall are reflected in perhaps on the silent statutes, for example, and in the case of Valletor in Kentucky. But like Shall, Your Honors, acting only in accordance with the advice, that too must be given a plain meaning in order to arrive at the true intent of the legislature. The role of the CEO under the Constitution must be seen as separate from the day-to-day -day administ administrative functions where he is under the direction and control of the commission. I repeat myself. The role of the CEO under the constitution must be seen as separate from his day-to-day -day administrative functions where he is under the direction and control of the commission. The promulgation of this specific advisory role to the level of the constitution must not be viewed as ordinary and taken lightly as elections are to be seen as being free of interference. Even the interference of the commission, which are made up of political commissioners. Accordingly, the words acting only in accordance with the advice of the chief elections officer are deliberate and clear and has to be given their true meaning. This case, this principle is supported by the Law Society of Botswana and another versus the President and others. Reported at 2017, PLRC, Law Reports of the Commonwealth. But it's instructive that this court held at paragraph 473, Your Honors, and I quote, the expression acting in accordance with the advice of had a subtle meaning that the person advised had to follow the advice given and act upon it. The president's role in the appointment of high court judges was and remained purely formal, and he was bound in the matter of an appointment as an individual, as a judge of the high court to act in accordance with the advice given to him by the Judicial Service Commission. As head of the executive, the president could put forward information and express concerns to the commission on the choice of a high court judge, either through attorney general who was a member of the commission or possibly otherwise in exceptional circumstances where issues of national security arose. But the decision on appointment was at the end a matter for the commission alone when the commission had evaluated the suitability of the candidates for appointment to the bench. And the president had no discretion to reject the decision of the commission. If he did so, his decision was subject to the judicial review on the ground of illegality. And so we respectfully submit in mutatis mutandis, Your Honors, that in this case, the chairman of the Elections Commission, whose position is merely formal, all being politically elected, simply to follow the advice given and act on it. For example, there's a danger of reading words into the constitutional provision. And all those words that were read in, the CEO can't act on his own. He's not a country, he doesn't have a constitutional mandate, etc. The law frowns at the courts frowned on that type of insertion into the clear, plain, ordinary meaning of constitutional provisions. And in the case of Nielsen and Barker, another 1982. We're none other than the former chancellor and 
Acting as he then was as a Justice of Appeal, Messiah, at page 285 said this, there is certainly in Article 45 of the Constitution no express reference to a right of abode. To read into the plain words of that provision a reference to a right of abode is an abuse of language. Further, to do so is not only to stray into strange semantic pastures, but to violate as well one of the fundamental colors of construction by which we are directed to read the words in the statute grammatically, termino terminologically, in the ordinary sense, without omission or addition. We rely entirely on the learning in this case one. Based on the foregoing, the Election Commission does not have a discretion as Article 172B states that the chairman shall declare acting only in accordance with the advice of the CEO. There's no other option to be given to the chairman. The chairman's role is purely formal, similar to that of the president in the cases mentioned. And we are reinforcing this belief also in approaching the interpretation of Article 172B by the Caribbean Court of Justice. And we're in the recent case of Ali and Jabdio, at paragraph 43 of his judgment, the court said this, and I quote, Article 177 2B always said what it meant and meant what it said. And therefore, Your Honors, in terms of ground three, we are saying that the failure by the chairman of the Elections Commission was an abdication of our constitutional duty to declare the president as the plain words of Article 177 2B as having been the elected president of the Portland Republic of Guyana. Your Honor, if I could move on. The question of Section 18 not being in collision with Article 177 2B, we reject that. And we say that the Section 18 itself is, in, is inherently flawed. It says the Chief Election Officer and the Commission of Registration shall not withstand anything notwithstanding anything in any written law, be subject to the direction and control of the commission. Now, the words notwithstanding, of course, would say that this provision takes precedent over all other provisions. Because written law is defined in the Constitution to include constitutional instruments that is defined under Section 5 of the Interpretation of General Clause is that written law means constitutional instruments, acts of parliament, subsidiary legislation, and applied laws. And constitutional instrument means the constitution of the Cooperative Republic of Vienna. And therefore, this article is saying that it is superior to the constitution. And obviously, Your Honor, that is a, a suggestion that will be confronted with the supremacy of the constitution, that where any law is inconsistent with it, such law to the extent of that inconsistency will be void. And we have Collymore and Attorney General Trinidad and Tobago that is authority for the proposition. Therefore, Section 18 cannot be used to curtail the important role of the Chief Elections Officer under the Constitution. And it's first submitted that Section 18 of the election laws also is a plain breach of the separation of powers doctrine for Parliament to properly transfer Otherwise, by a constitutional alteration, legislative functions of amending the principle of primary legislation to an executive body, which is GCOM. There are many cases on that, but there is a case, Benjamin and the Ministry of Information, reported out of High Court of Anguilla, where the current president of the CCJ, when he was then Justice Saunders, stated, our democracy rests on three fundamental pillars, the legislative, executive, and judiciary. All must keep it in the bounds of the Constitution. The Constitution has the task of seeing to it that the legislative and executive action does not stray outside those boundaries onto forbidden territory. So the conclusion in that regard, Your Honor, is that the Chief Election Officer, when he's doing his constitutional duty, has a constitutional mandate, and that must be respected by our courts and, and by the actors that are involved. Your Honor, quickly, if I could move on to the question that the Lord Chief Justice did, did direct her mind to the racial decision and I 
only being binding and not orbital. But the Lord Chief Justice did not apply the principle in relation to the facts before. So that when we look at the reason for saying that matters were res judicata because of Esmond David and the Ali and Jack deal, let's examine that because the basic principle is that only the racial dissidenti is binding on a court. And when you apply that principle to as in David, for example, and you look to see what was the issue there. The issue in as in David was the interpretation of more votes are cast in Article 177 2B. They, and in Ali and Jagio, the issue was whether the court of appeal in as in David had properly assumed jurisdiction vested in it under Article 177 4 of the Constitution. In addition to that, the court was concerned with its own jurisdiction, that is the CCJ. So those issues are not before the court in Messenger of Jones's current matter. So they, therefore, they could only be arbiter. And this court will not be bound by the ruling of the Lord Chief Justice that these matters are res judicata. The authorities are listed in our submissions, Your Honor. And I respectfully guide Your Honor. I, I wish just to say one relate to one case and that is the Raja case, Raja versus Van Hoogenstraten, 2009, one WLR, where Mumbri Lord Justice made the following remark. We do not consider that in Isaacs and Robertson, Lord Deplock was intended to say that the inherent jurisdiction of the court could be invoked to make an order which was inconsistent with the rules. In any event, the ratio of the decision was that an order made by a court of unlimited jurisdiction had to be obeyed unless or until set aside. What Lord de Block said about the relationship between the court's inherent jurisdiction and its powers under the rules was not necessary for the decision and was arbiter dicta. And we are urging the court to apply that principle. And therefore we submit that the Lord Chief Justice erred when she concluded that she could not invalidate Order 60. Your Honor, as we say in these matters, the, the question of the the striking down of or the sixth and all of these things, my not friend would deal with that, but the, the saying that you couldn't strike it down because of res judicata would not be applicable. But assuming and not admitting some irregularity in relation to the 10 declarations, only an election court in an election petition can inquire and investigate into the factual merits or demerits of such irregularity on the jurisdiction created by Article 163. So when the Lord Chief Justice said that the 10 declarations were overtaken by the recount, we respectfully submitting that the Lord Chief Justice was not sitting in an election petitions court and there was nothing Nothing has set aside the 10 declarations. In fact, GCOM itself did not before, re until recently, applications were made to them to set them, set them aside, but they couldn't be. Why was that so? Because GCOM was not taken into, was not taken by the propaganda that the Region 4 declaration was fraudulent because the allegations of the first declaration were set aside by the Chief, Learning Chief Justice, who directed the, C the arrow to return and continue to count using his own procedure. And an attempt was made to file a contempt motion to that. But it was never followed up. And the your time is up. Yes, Your, your time just, is up. So please wrap up. Yes, please. Just to say quickly that the same principle applies to the recount as the, they applied to the 10 declarations. The 10 declarations are extant because only in the election petition court could set them aside. And Your Honor, I hand over to my, thank you very much, I hand over to my lawyer. Good morning again, Your Honors. Permit me to begin my submissions, Your Honor, with the short- Mr. Report. Edwards? Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Edwards, you and the Attorney General were allocated 20 minutes. 
But remember that you would have an opportunity on the cross appeal to make uh, any further submissions that affect your cross appeal. So perhaps in your 15 minutes that you will be allowed after this hearing, which is the hearing on the main appeal, you might uh, wish to um, make further submissions, but we have to move on to um, Mr. Khan. So Mr. Yes, Edwards, uh, we suggest that you take up uh, your further submissions during the cross appeal. You can manage your time in that way. As a pleasure, Mr. Court. As a pleasure. Mr. Khan? Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Good morning. My submissions this morning will center essentially on two aspects. That is, as indicated by the learned Chief Justice in her ruling, the frontal attack such that it is on Order 60, and whether or not the decisions involved in this particular matter are in fact matters which have been relitigated. I wanted to begin first by pointing out that We know in the light of the fact that we have the decision of Justice of Appeal Prasad is unanimity on certain issues. And I wanted to begin by pointing out that at paragraph 22 of Justice Prasad's decision, he essentially endorsed the view that was In which held. matter, Mr. Khan, are you referring to the decision of Justice Prasad? Yes, Your Honor, I'm referring to the decision of Justice Prasad in Yulita Moore. That was a decision that was made available to us. And at paragraph 22 of his decision, he endorsed the views expressed by the full court as it relates to the aspect of jurisdiction. So that what we have before the court on that particular issue is in effect a unanimous decision of the Court of Appeal that it does in fact have jurisdiction to hear and entertain certain kinds of matters, albeit on a narrow basis. And that is in further furtherance of the submissions that we would have made at the high court level following the majority decision of Yulita Moore. And I believe that on that front, our respectful contention is that there was, in fact, jurisdiction to hear the matter. As it relates, Your Honor, to the attack on Order 60. Uh, Mr. Khan. Yes, Your Honor. You there was jurisdiction on what basis? To, on, on the, the basis. Court had jurisdiction because the, uh, many principles have been put forward in relation to jurisdiction. So, for example, uh, Chief Justice uh, acted on the basis of uh, smoothening out, as it was put, smoothening out the process. Uh, another principle could be that came up in Yulita more in the majority decision was that uh, there might have been an excess of jurisdiction. So what is the basis on which you say that the High Court had jurisdiction? Your Honor, I, I say that the High Court has jurisdiction in line with the dicta in Aubrey Norton, where the court has always had an inherent capacity to review when it comes to illegality. And Your Honor, I wanted to point out at paragraph three of our submissions, where the authors of Wade and Foresight observed, and I quote, that the long line of decisions bring out what the dicta ignore, namely that appeal and review exist for different purposes. The first concerning merits and the second concerning illegality. And this is the important aspect which I, in response to the question, and that review of illegality is the primary mechanism of enforcing the rule of law under the inherent jurisdiction of the court so that the court at all times under its inherent jurisdiction to enforce the rule of law 
can review an allegation of, of illegality. And the nub of what was put to the court in the application of Mazinga Jones was effectively that Order 60 was illegal and that, and that Section 22 was similarly unconstitutional. So that in that regard, the court had a power to review it, not necessarily to go into the lawfulness of it, but whether or not it was legal or not, which is the distinction that Wade has made between appeals and judicial review. We have also expanded on that particular aspect of our submissions in the high court level, but for the purposes of brevity, we simply rely on it, Your Honors. Do you have anything to say on the on pass between the CEO and uh, or what was taking place uh, in the commission? That was also a basis uh, on which the court. Yes, Your Honor. Acted. The court, the high court. Uh, felt able to exercise jurisdiction to to move the process along. So what do you say about that jurisdiction? Your Honor, I believe that, that, that having regard to the clear difference of opinion, for want of a better term, between the chief elections officer and the chairman of the commission, the court, I believe, in those particular circumstances, is duty bound to offer a ruling based on its inherent jurisdiction on its inherent jurisdiction from the common law in attempting to understand and appreciate what it is we're dealing with in these series of matters your honor we are essentially chart we are in uncharted territory and more often than not it is the resort to the basic principles that obtain from the common law which ultimately will guide the court and I believe that the Chief Justice, while she may not have said that, is essentially relying on basic common law doctrine to say that as a court of superior record, we are entitled and in some respects duty bound to say that this is how this should be interpreted, this is how it should be understood, this is how it should be applied. And that would be my response in relation to the approach of the Chief Justice in resolving the impasse. Please continue. Thank you. Yes. Most gratefully. Now, as I indicated previously, the writ in our written submissions, the attack essentially is on whether or not Order 60 is valid law. Whether or not Order 60, as part of the legislative construct, so to speak, can be entertained as something upon which the courts can act. And I wanted to point to three particular phrases that are used in the judgment of the Caribbean Court of Justice in Eslin Davis. In paragraph 35 of Eslin Davis, the Caribbean Court of Justice speaks of an examination of the legal and constitutional scheme. In paragraph 46 of Eslin Davis, it speaks of the legal infrastructure. And at paragraph 47, it refers to the constitutionally anchored electoral laws. My submission in that regard is that when you look at the judgment as a whole, and when you look at the language that is dispersed throughout that judgment, the inescapable conclusion is that the CCJ intended to examine and give its imprimatur to Order 60 in a way that gave it a purposive construction. While it expressly acknowledged that there was a tension, that tension it resolved in the context of what it described in paragraph 35, I believe it was, of its submissions as being something which is intended to, and the words they use was, fill the gap. So that you have a certain situation where the CCJ has essentially said this about Order 60. Order 60 has a presumption, which is, I believe all of us agree, has a presumption of legality. Before you decide to throw out Order 60, you have to see and determine whether or not Order 60 can be interpreted in such a way and in such a manner that is not inconsistent with 
either the representation of the People's Act or the respective constitutional provisions. My respectful submission in that regard was that the CCJ did exactly that. And it came up with a formulation which said that Order 60 is to be viewed as filling the gap. And these are very important words, most respectfully. It is not that Order 60 attempted to, as the Court of Appeal had previously decided, creating, created a new regime. All it was intended to do was to say, look, these are circumstances for which the re representation of the People's Act did not cater. There is an overarching ambit and purpose as contained in the Constitution. So when you ally Order 60 with the constitutional over, overreach or supervision, it gives the Guyana Elections Commission the power to make the very regulations that it did, which then in turn led to the recount. And it is for those reasons, Your Honor, when you examine the CCJ's decision, carefully reasoned, Order 60 is not thrown out. Order 60 is given its place in the context of the hierarchy of legislation that we're considering. Your Honor, I wanted to move on to the issue of res judicata and also in that regard to point out this, that when we look at the decision in Holodar, when we look at the decision in Ulita Moore, when we look at the decision in Eslin David, all three of those decisions are final decisions. Holodar has not been appealed. Ulita Moore has not been appealed. And I believe it is trite to mention that Eslin David is a pronouncement of our final court. That becomes important when we examine it in the context of what the learned authors of Halsbury's, and I refer your honors to paragraph 24. I refer your honors to paragraph 24 of my submissions, where I looked at Halsbury's Laws of England, 5th edition, 12a. And Halsbury's Laws of England, 5th edition, says this, that every final judgment is conclusive evidence against all the world of its existence, date, and legal consequences. It goes on to say this, that it is a fundamental doctrine of all courts that there must be an end of litigation and that a party may plead the doctrine of res judicata by way of estoppel. Where a judgment has been given in a matter and is a matter of record, and I believe there's no contention here that the judgments I referred to earlier are judgments as a matter of record. An estoppel by record arises and may take the form of cause of action estoppel or issue estoppel. It may also said to be that a cause of action has been merged into the judgment, end of quote. Your Honours, so when these particular applicants come to the court and ask you, in effect, to look at this matter, and to say to you, for example, that I am Miss Inga Davis, I am not Yulita Moore, I am not any other party. What the court has to have regard to, in the words of Halsbury, is the date, existence, and legal consequences. This is a judgment of record. The court has to take into account what it has said and what are its implications. Secondly, and and to the point of privity, because much has been made of the fact that we're dealing with different parties. And in that regard, I refer your honors to my submissions again, and the case from Trinidad, the first instance of the Attorney General of Trinidad and Tobago versus the Trinidadian, Trinidad and Tobago Civil Rights Association. That is contained at paragraphs 19 and 20 of my submissions, your honor. And the court in that particular judgment said this, quote, it must be remembered that the beneficiary of public interest litigation is not the person who takes the trouble to challenge the decision. It is by definition the public, end of quote. So regardless of who the nominal party is, 
when one looks at the learning that has discerned from this particular judgment, allied with the fact that we know from Halsbury's that this is a decision which, in the words of Halsbury's, it exists, it has legal consequences, it is a matter of record. One cannot come to any other conclusion that what is contained in those judgments, in fact, impacts any subsequent action on the part of any other person who chooses to come to court under the guise of being a different person to relitigate these matters. And it is for that reason, Your Honors, that I believe that the judgment of the learned Chief Justice in determining that this was in fact res judicata is quite on point. Your Honors, if one were to put a finer point on it, and I am must say that I'm grateful to one of my learned friends who pointed this out. We have a situation where when one looks at the record, and I will ask your honors to look at the record of the application in support of Missinga Jones. If your honors have it at hand, if your honors look at paragraph 14 of the affidavit in support of Missinga Jones, Um, is your honor, does, does your honors have it in front of you? We, we, go ahead, please, Mr. Khan. I yes. don't have mine, but okay. I'm following you. Ms. Inga Jones, in her affidavit at paragraph 14, speaks of an exhibit entitled UM3. Your honors, UM3 refers to Yulita Moore. It is as patent and as blatant as that. When one gets to that level, Your Honors, we are find ourselves in circumstances where we are treading in, 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 in very dark territory. And it is for that reason, when one looks at these, at the sequence of events and the affidavits that we have in front of us, we can come to only one conclusion that what is before us is in fact a barefaced attempt to relitigate what the courts have already decided. And it is for those reasons, Your Honor, that I believe that the court ought not to countenance what is currently taking place. That the courts ought to, in very clear and definitive terms, say that there must be an end to litigation, to use the words of Halsbury's. Your Honours, I would defer a further expansion of the other issues as I believe that my friends will no doubt deal with them. But if the court has any questions regarding my submissions or any other matter which the court would like some clarification in relation to my own presentation, I'd be happy to provide it, failing which that would be all for our submissions. Thank you, Mr. Khan. We have no further questions and we move on to, uh, is it Mr. Mr. Mendez? Much obliged to your honor. I'm grateful um, for the submissions made by my learned friends who went before me who oppose the appeal. And it will allow me to um, shorten to some extent what I intended to say. But I, I think I endorse um, what my little friend Ms. Kite has, has said to the court already, and I would wish to emphasize that as we speak at the moment, the law governing elections in Guyana consists of those, those relevant provisions of the Constitution that have been referred to, including, of course, the provision that gives GCOM an independent body that has security of tenure. The, uh, the supervision and the conduct of elections and, of course, supervision of its employees and officers, including the CEO. It consists also of the representation of the People's Act. It also consists of the Election Laws Amendment Act, including Section 22, which gives the Commission certain powers in certain circumstances. And it includes Section 18 of that Act, which, which uh, makes it very clear that the chief elections officer is under the direction and control of GCOM. 
the law as it stands as well governing elections consists of order 60, which has been made under section 22. Those provisions altogether um, consist of the law pertaining to elections. And that law um, has required that a recount be held, a recount has been held, and, the, and Order 60 itself provides that GCOM was to decide when the results of the recount was presented to it, whether the uh, report by the CEO under Section 96 was to be carried out in accordance with the recount. That's the law. GCOM compliance with, the, with Order 60 and compliance with Order 60 gave a direction to the CEO that he must prepare his Section 96 report in accordance with the recount. So, so far, so for good, the GCOM has followed the law governing elections, inclusive of Order 60. What we have is a situation where the CEO has said that he is not going to follow um, that direction. He's not going to follow Order 60, even though he went through the entire process supervising the recount. Uh, even though he gave a report to GCOM of the results of the recount showing that the PPP had won the election. He's this, he has decided that he is not following the recount because he has taken the view that the recount is invalid. And therefore, he has taken the view, I don't know who's advised him, but he has taken the view that he's going back to the declarations. Now, <clears throat> so that there is an impasse, and we respectfully submit in, this, in these circumstances, the High Court does have the jurisdiction to make such orders as may be necessary to resolve that impasse, more particularly to ensure that the elections process is complete. Now, having regard to the fact that the law includes Order 60 at this point in time, which includes the recount, the only order logically consistent with the law as it is that the court can make, is to require the chief elections officer to comply with the law, that is to say, to prepare his section 96 report in accordance with the recount. Now, we say that the court has jurisdiction in this limited sense to intervene at this stage and not um, defer to an election petition because you can't bring an election petition until the election is declared. So you're in a catch-22 situation. The only way that the election can be completed so that the election petition process under Article 163 can be invoked is to make the necessary orders to complete the process. The CEO can't hold it up. He can't decide for himself. He cannot make any decisions as to what law is invalid and what law is not. If he's doing that, then he is violating the separation of powers doctrine because a member of the executive cannot decide what laws are valid and what laws are not valid. That is just simply basic constitutional law. And therefore, his obligation is to comply with the law. We should not be here at all. The fact that he has decided not to comply with the, with the directions of GCOM made clearly pursuant to Order 60 has allowed um, this appellant to come to court in order to stop it. He has provided the basis for these proceedings. In other words, we should not be here. He should have done his duty as a public officer and comply with the directions of GCOM. Now, so faced with that and faced with that obvious situation, what the appellant says is, well, those laws under which the election is being operated those laws that GCOM is following and G those laws that GCOM uh, is requiring the chief elections officer to follow, those laws are unconstitutional. So they are saying Section 22 is unconstitutional and therefore the order made under Section 22 is unconstitution, unconstitutional. The Attorney General is also saying that Section 18 itself, by which the CEO must comply with the directions of, the, of GCOM, that is also unconstitutional. So there's a, an, and they go further to say, well, quite apart from the issues of constitutionality, the order itself, the order for the recount is invalid for a number of different reasons, what, that it didn't follow the precise terms of the Representation of the People Act, that um, they raised the retrospectivity point, 
that was raised in the Ulita Moore case. In other words, much the same arguments that was put before the court in the Ulita Moore case um, um, trotted out once again in these proceedings. So here we are. Now, when, before the constitution um, in 1980 was enacted and before the amendments in 2000 and so on, there were two very important decisions um, in the um, constitutional jurisprudence, the election jurisprudence of Ghana, and those were the Petri and the Sikuma cases. And both cases decided that even where you are saying that the constitutionality of the laws under which the election um, is being conducted is in question, even when you're saying those laws are unconstitutional, the courts say that you must raise that point after the election, not before. The message is, let the election be completed under the laws as they exist. And if you consider that the election is unconstitutional as a reason, because they were made under unconstitutional laws, then you take that point afterwards. That is the position, that was the position prior to 1980. So the appellants face that, that, that obstacle in its way. They must say that um, Petri and Sikumar don't apply because it is Petri and Sikumar are directly on point. But more than that, they have to um, overcome the obstacle of this, this court's decision in, in um, Ulita Moore. And my learned friend, the Skite, has taken you to some of the um, relevant passages, and I will take you to some others. And I can save time by just um, directing your attention to paragraph 108, in which you had um, referred to section 140 of the RPA. And you said that this excludes <coughs> the court's intervention in relation to functions which fall within the responsibilities of GCOM in its management of the elections process. You said that at 108, at paragraph 85, you said, uh, <clears throat> whether the time had come to proceed under Article 177 and Section 99, and the decision whether to hold a recount or not were matters that were central to the elections and fell squarely within the domain of GCOM to determine as part of the management of the elections. The functions performed in relation to those responsibilities would be shielded by section 141. <clears throat> that is an obstacle in the way of the appellants in, in uh, making the points which they would wish to make in these proceedings. Um, the court is saying the, whether the time has come to proceed under Article 177 or Section 99 is not to be um, reviewed by this court because Section 140 says so. Well, that is exactly what GCOM is saying in this case. GCOM is saying we have not yet come to the point of declaring the election in section, under Section 99 or Section 177 because the CEO has not yet produced a report in accordance with the law, that is to say, in accordance with the recount. We have given him directions to do so and he hasn't complied. So we have not yet come to 177 and section 99. This court has said that that decision is not reviewable because of, one, of section 140. It also said in that paragraph, whether to hold a recount or not are matters which are shielded from review by this court under section 140 of the act. In the very following page at paragraph 80, the court repeated, on our view of the affidavit evidence issues raised in the FDA in relation to whether article 77 and section 99 were triggered and whether the re proposed recount is lawful are matters which fall for determination under article 163 of the constitution. That is a very clear determination. Whether the proposed recount is unlawful are matters which fall for determination under 163. Yet still the appellant has come to court and asked you to determine that the recount that, that GCOM is saying the CEO must comply with is unlawful. Exactly what you have said must be taken up under <clears throat> Article 163. And then, of course, there's um, paragraphs 106 and 107 that the learned friend of Skite has already referred to, and I do not therefore need to read it, except to emphasize that in that paragraph in 106, you referred to Petri and um, Sikumar, and those cases say that questions concerning the constitutionality of election laws must be taken up after the election by way of an election petition. So you have very clear determination by this court on the court's jurisdiction, and this applies frontally to the appellant's case. 
Now, the, <clears throat> a lot has been said about res judicata, but I understand what this court has done in the Ulita Mo case is to declare the law, is to declare the, the reach and ambit of section 140 of the RPA. Like any declaration of the law, any interpretation of the law or the constitution, that binds everyone. It is not a question of res judicata as much as it's a question of stare decisis. This is judicial precedent. This is part of the law of Guyana until that law is overturned by a higher court. And all courts must abide by it, including this court, because the rule is that the court of appeal in civil matters is bound by its own decisions until those decisions are overturned by the higher court. Now, it is important in that regard, um, your honors, to take you very briefly to the, to the decision of the South African court in Restate versus Walters, which had been um, attached to our reply filed yesterday, and in particular to paragraph to page 521, in which the court quoted um, with approval from um, the text on the South African legal system and its background by Halo and Khan. And this is what they said, if I can read it very quickly. The maintenance of the certainty of the law and equality before it, the satisfaction of legitimate expectations, entail a general duty of judges to follow the legal rul rulings in previous judicial decisions. The individual litigant would feel himself unjustly treated if a past ruling applicable to his case were not followed where the material facts were the same. This authority given to past judgments is called the doctrine of precedent. It enables the citizen, if necessary, with the aid of practicing lawyers, to plan his private and professional activities with some degree of assurance as to their legal effects. It prevents the dislocation of rights, particularly contractual and proprietary ones, created in the belief of an existing rule of law. It cuts down the prospects of litigation. It keeps a weaker judge along right and rational paths, drastically limiting the play allowed to partiality, caprice, or prejudice, thereby not only securing justice in the instance, but also retaining public confidence in the judicial machine through like being dealt with alike. Certainty, predictability, reliability, equality, uniformity, convenience. These are the practical advantages to be gained by a legal system from the principle of stare decisis. Now, Your Honours, it is important that in Ulita Moore, the, the court felt able to intervene only to the extent of saying that GCOM could not um, order a recount under the supervision of CARICOM. Other than that, you did not interfere. There were a number of uh, same arguments that were put before the court at that point in time, but you only interfered to the extent of saying that you could not, the GCOM could not give CARICOM supervisory powers. And then since then, you know what has happened. The parties have drawn up um, collaboratively Order 60. The parties have participated in a 34-day process resulting in, in the recount. And not only that, as a, after the recount was done and after GCOM required the, um, the CEO to comply with the recount, the proceedings in Eslin David was, um, uh, were, were commenced before this court. And in that court in which the Attorney General was a party and he joined with Eslin David, what they were seeking to do was to have Order 60 enforced. As a matter of fact, they asked this court to interpret the constitution in the light of Order 60. They were trying to get GCOM to follow Order 60. And indeed, this court, on the, on the assumption that no one before it, including the Attorney General, was challenging the validity of Order 60, made a ruling that the constitution was to be interpreted in light of Order 60. That case went to the, the, the CCJ, and again, no one before the CCJ challenged the validity of Order 60. And that was the premise of the CCJ's judgment in that case. The Attorney General as well was not concerned at that point in time with the, with the constitutionality of Order 60. In other words, all of the parties to these proceedings, all of the political parties who are represented here, the Attorney General, all of them have conducted themselves on the basis of the court's ruling in Ulita Moore that any question concerning the constitutionality or the otherwise legality of the recount must be dealt with on an election petition. That is the importance of stare decisis. So when things appear not to be going um, their way, 
they decide, well, forget what we have said before about Order 60 and trying to enforce it. We are now going to say that it's invalid. And the Attorney General has joined in that. With all due respect, Your Honours, the, the ruling of this court was correct in Ulita Moore. Questions of constitutionality and legality of the recount must be taken up by an election petition. The process must be allowed to be completed because, as you pointed out in paragraph 106, otherwise there will be undue disruption in the process as we go along. We must get to an end. We must get to an end to the process. And if parties are unhappy with, what, with the result, they can take it up by way of election petition. Now, as I said, the, 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 the arguments have been made very forcefully about unconstitutionality, but it is not unusual that an election is determined while there are these allegations that the laws are unconstitutional. That happened in Petri and it happened in Sikumar. The legal system did not, come up to, did not crash. Democracy didn't suffer because it is an important principle of election law that you allow the elections to be completed and any question of invalidity you take up afterwards in a, an election petition. Now, Your Honours, I have um, just about two and a half minutes left as, um, by my count to make this point. If the court decides that it will entertain the question of constitutionality, despite your previous decision that you would not do so, then you will have to decide whether Section 22 is unconstitutional, but then you will have to end, and in, in that regard, you'll have to consider the submissions that we have made, which we cross-reference in our submission. It seems that Mr. Jeremy missed that, but we have incorporated our answers to these constitutionality points in our submissions um, in the court below. So you'll have to determine whether 22 is unconstitutional. You will then have to consider our argument as to whether the unconstitutional parts have been severed if you decide that it is unconstitutional. And then you'll have to consider the, all of the other arguments that we have made, that even if you were to find that the recount did not comply strictly with the RPA, you will have to consider the question whether Parliament intended the recount to be invalid. In other words, you'll have to consider the, what used to be called the mandatory directory dichotomy. Are those provisions that the recount did not strictly comply with under the RPA, are they such as to render the recount in, um, invalid because what the recount has done and nobody's challenging the accuracy of it. Their complaints about irregularities and so on and the CCJ has already said that must be dealt with under Article 163. The point is that there is a recount and nobody is challenging um, the fact that the recount correctly added up the ballots and added up the votes. So what you have in the recount is an accurate reflection of the will of the electorate. Is it Parliament's intention? that you cast that aside and you hold that invalid because the um, certain particular provisions of the RPA have not been followed. If you go down the route of considering invalidity, the honors, you will have to resolve that question as well, along with all of the other arguments, all of the respondents have made in opposition to the, to the um, arguments made on invalidity. As far as the question of considering um, Mr. Mingo's declaration, I understand that that is something that I will be permitted to address um, in a, a later on um, in relation to the cross appeal. Am I correct, Your Honor? Yes, you'll get 15 minutes on the cross appeal to argue the cross appeal. I'm much obliged. And in, in which case, that is, I've just, I believe, just crossed my 20 minutes. And um, Mr. 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 Mendes. Yes, Your On the question of Section 140, uh, in the cross appeal arguments, I would ask if you can address Section 140 a little more, because there uh, is there seems to be some um, difference of opinion on Section 140. Um, whether Section 140 can, in fact, uh, protect uh, certain functions under the Constitution, or whether Section 140, in fact, operates in relation only to the RPA. Because in Yulita Moore, this court uh, considered Section 140 
in both aspects. And so uh, could you uh, help, help the court in your discussion on the jurisdiction point this afternoon? I, I will do so, and, and, and yes, thank you. And it would it would of course help me if I know exactly what aspect of the Constitution is being referred to, um, so that I can address it as well. You wish me to tell you more? Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I'm well, sorry to be asking you a question, Your Honours, but no, if, if I, I, the question, question is yeah. whether Section 140 in providing that shield yes. to certain functions. Does that shield relate only to functions under the RPA, which, uh, of which Section 140 is part? Or does the shield also relate to other functions carried out under the Constitution? I'm getting the sense that there is a difference of opinion in relation to the reach of section 140 when it comes to functions under the constitution i will address that question yes, Much thank you. <laughs> yes council we had uh, uh, adjusted the lunch break and we would like to take that break at this point and to continue at 12.15. And at that time, we will hear the arguments of the ninth respondents. So we'll adjourn until until 12.15. Thank you for your submissions so far. Good night.